Everybody's got a price, it's the million dollar man What's up, everybody? It's Marcus D'Angelo, and we're back for another episode of Everybody's Got a Pod. And, of course, I am joined by the Million Dollar Man himself, the Hall of Famer, Ted DiBiase. Ted, what's going on, my friend? Uh, not a whole lot. I feel like a million bucks today. <laughs> I am glad to hear it. Despite the cold down there. I'm, I'm healthy and what have you. It's uh, Yeah, except they're, uh, you know, like uh, uh, the garbage pickup in our, uh, in, in our neighborhood comes every Tuesday and and friday yeah uh yesterday was a beautiful day here you know and so i you know i you know i had a I had on a pair of shorts and a t-shirt i have a t-shirt on now and i was gonna take the garbage to the to the curb and oh my gosh i walked outside and then oh my yeah it was, it's freezing cold here it's like a only like uh you know like 40 or 50 degrees so oh, that is, I mean, that is like a summer breeze uh, compared to what I'm dealing with here in Pittsburgh. It is, oh. it is very cold up here. And I've got to take it today as we're recording, it's Halloween. So I've got to take my little one trick or treating. Are you taking the uh, grandkids out? Um, what our grandkids are doing is, and I think this is pretty cool. They are going to um, one of the, uh, um, my daughter-in-law, well, Leah was my daughter-in-law and he, she, Leah had been married to Brett. They divorced, yeah. but Leah's sister, um, and her husband have a big party and, and they, they, they invite all these kids and they have a big, uh, party at their house. Like, a, you know, do the whole thing, you know, uh, Halloween and ghouls and goblins and what have you. And I think so, you know, I, I think my, my wife's going to go, uh, to the big, uh, Halloween party. And, and, uh, and I said, well, have a good time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll stay here and I will uh, answer the door for the trick or treaters. <laughs> there you go. I, I think you got the better end of that deal, Ted. That sounds nice. <laughs> now, whenever you're doing the trick or treating in your neighborhood and you're handing out candy to kids, I mean, you're back on WWE Network now and people get to kind of refresh and re see you now. And new generations of kids get to see the million dollar man. Does anybody ever say, uh, hey, you look kind of familiar? It, you know, it happens to me a lot. And, and what, what is surprising to me, and, and, it, and it, just, it happened just recently that somebody came up and he says, he says, excuse me, I, I don't mean to barge in or, uh, you know, bother you. I said, but, you know, um, I, I think I know who you are. I said, are you Ted DiBiase? And I said, yes, I am. And he says, I've been a big fan. And it's, and that's, I'm like, I'm looking at you and, and this guy's like, like, well, maybe 25 or something. And I said, how do you know me? I mean, you weren't, you weren't even alive when I was wrestling. And, and, uh, he said, uh, well, you know, he's got the network, yep. you know, and if you've got the network, apparently you can watch, I mean, I, I, I knew, I knew that Vince did this years ago. He bought up all like anything in any territory that was on tape he bought it all yeah, he owns true. all of wrestling now there's no like you know it's kind of like uh all the territory stuff you know like uh that was you know like a lot of a lot of times that stuff would be taped and then you know the show might be taped over you know because they use the same tape or some something right. i don't know but uh he's got it all I mean, nobody had the foresight back then to think of uh, streaming, certainly not, but even the foresight of like saying, hey, it's valuable to have this video library in case fans want to go back and revisit it. I can monetize it, maybe even turn into VHSs back in the day. Like nobody really had that that vision or foresight, but Vince McMahon apparently did because like you said, he wound up scooping up pretty much everything from the territories, I think, except from like for like the Memphis stuff. 
aside yeah. from that vince wound up with everything uh, yeah. which is incredible and it's great for you guys because now it's like kind of breeze you know i've heard other guys say like it breeze kind of like a second life into their career because now all these kids are watching back some of this stuff and they become a fan of the million dollar man yeah and that's that's yes i don't know it's just it's i don't know it's it's a blessing i guess because uh you know, to be recognized by someone who, you know, you know, it's kind of like, I guess it'd be like me, uh, you know, like being a fan of some movie star that, you know, was, you know, way back and when. Right. You know, right. so uh, people today don't think about it, but like, if you were really into a TV show in the eighties, you had to be home when that TV show was going to be on yeah. or else you just missed it. Yeah, and that's it. And like, they might do a replay yeah. sometime down yeah. the road. They might not. Now it's you know you can you can get your hands on anything, no matter when you miss it. So yeah. it's, a, it's a whole new world. And uh, I'll tell you what, man, it's it's a whole new world since forty years ago, which is how far back we're going uh, today. We're making a return to nineteen eighty three and your time in Georgia Championship Wrestling, which now had been apparently renamed to World Championship Wrestling. Um, and we're covering October and November of 83 this week, and it takes you from Japan back to Georgia and some really big matches. So I'm excited to continue this story, Ted. Uh, we started with, with you in Mid-South in 83, and now you're in the Georgia territory. As we discussed on the last episode, you got yourself suspended after a vicious attack on Tommy Rich in the Omni in September, but you've got big plans in mind. Let's have a look at our first clip this week. Championship wrestling. First you find me. Now you suspend me for five weeks, thinking that it's going to put a cramp in my style. Well, let me tell you something. I'm a man in championship wrestling, in a wrestling world that can go any place I want to go. With my ability, I'm wanted all over the world, and I have an open contract right now to go to Japan. So I'll just go to Japan for five weeks, but I'll be back. And when I come back, I'm going to pick up right where I left off. I told you people that I was going to hurt Tommy Rich, and that's exactly what I did. I do what I say I'm going to do, and I've got another man in mind when I get back. And when I come back, I'll hurt him too. If it has to be in the confines of that ring and to keep myself from being suspended further, then that I can do. I am the greatest scientific wrestler you've ever seen. But the difference in Ted DiBiase now, as I told you people before, is that I don't care about being Mr. Nice Guy. Whatever it takes, anything it takes to win, to put that money in the palm of my hand, is exactly what I'm going to do. Where is Tommy Rich right now? He's laid out somewhere wondering what happened to him because he's a nice guy. Well, this is not a nice guy anymore. You're looking at a champion. You're looking at a winner. And when I come back, people, I'm coming back to stay. And oh, yes, naturally. I'm number one, and I'm going to be number one here and everywhere that you can see this space on World Championship Wrestling. So I'll take my suspension. I'll go to Japan. I'll go wherever else they want me because I am in big demand. And when I come back, I'll be back to stay. <laughs> Ted, that was a hell of a promo, man. <laughs> wow, man. <laughs> that, yeah. Gosh, I was getting mad. <laughs> no. and, uh, oh, wow. Those sunglasses you had on, they were, like it was a really cool look, like uh, like very kind of a Ric Flair thing going on. Yeah, there. yeah. Um, oh, and, and plus, like that smug kind of attitude that you had, and that look on your face. I mean, you were just. Yeah. You were selling it really great. And the promo, by the way, it was very like Jake Roberts-esque in that you weren't doing any shouting. Uh, you weren't very yeah. loud on the mic. You, it was yeah. it was almost like, again, we had to like sort of lean in to hear what you had to say. Um, when in your career do you think that you really started to dial in your ability on the microphone, Ted? You know, I, I really couldn't say, uh, Marcus. I just, uh, I don't know. It, it was one of those things. It's like... Um, I remember that when I first started wrestling that, um, I, you know, I wasn't, obviously I was on the opening match and, and, I, and I wasn't doing interviews, but I went to the TV station every, I think back then, this was when in Shreveport at the TV station and, uh, cause all the guys 
I can't remember what day of the week it was. I th- well, yeah, I think it was. I think it was Wednesday. Here, oh no, here's the day. We would wrestle in Shreveport on Tuesday night. Wednesday morning, they would do their interviews for that week at the TV station. And you know, Dick Murdoch and Killer Carl Cox, and those were the that was the those were the highliners at the time. And then we would drive from Shreveport. 200 miles to Jackson, Mississippi, where I live now, and 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 ha- have a show. But on Wednesday morning, they would do the interviews. So, but every Wednesday, I didn't have to be up, and I didn't have to go down there. But I would go down to the TV station, and I I knew what the angles were. I you know, and I paid attention, and I I just listened. I listened to the guys that were really good on the mic. And, and I just tried to glean from them and gradually that's, you know, you know how I got it. So, but you know, the other thing that's really interesting is that you had, you had this really, uh, very unique promo style that was all yours whenever you got to the WWF. And so, but however, it, it's different from that promo that you just delivered here in Georgia, uh, and, and you were a heel in both territories. So it's just, yeah. it's really fascinating, uh, how kind of versatile you would go on to be when it came to, uh, to delivering your promos. Were you delivering promos like in front of a mirror to practice or were you more just like absorbing and then you just go out there and give it, give it your best shot? You know, Marcus said back then, brother, I, you know. I knew what the program was and I would have an idea, but I, I, you know, I never, uh, it wasn't until much later when, when the, you know, when the WWF become the WWE and they would give you scripted stuff. And I, I told them even then I said, you know, you can give me this, but I'm not going to say what's on this thing word for word. I'm going to, I'm going to take the idea that I see is being expressed here and I'm going to do it my way because if it doesn't, if I don't do it my way, then it's not going to sound like me. And that's what I did. And they, then they let me do it, you know, because they know I could. Man, nowadays, everything, uh, from what I hear, um, you know, I'm obviously not behind the scenes in WWE, but from what I hear, everything is scripted and you have to hit all these points. And it's very, it's like, you know, we hear that back in like even the late 90s, it was, it was more like bullet points. They'd say like, hey, we want you to go out there and say something to this effect. Yeah. And they go out there and do it. But now apparently it's, you're, you're kind of more of a soap opera actor than you are a wrestler sometimes. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know if I'd be able to do it. No, um, no. And, you know, I, I mean, I'm, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to knock it. I mean, you know, that's the other thing. I was like, I don't, um, I guess, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm old school because I was raised old school and that's how it worked for me. And, you know, um, and I'm, I'm not Vince McMahon and I don't know all that Vince McMahon knows, um, you know, and, and, and who knows, maybe there's a reason now you know, for, for them to follow a, um, a script, um, you know, but I'm just, I just never had to. <laughs> As we mentioned last time we discussed 1983, you are off to Japan to compete, to compete in the giant series. And they're going to work your ass off when you're over there in singles and tag team matches. Uh, while you're there, you're going to work with the likes, the likes of Tenru, Giant Baba, Akia Sato, and the Great Kabuki, among others. Ted, what can you tell us about dealing with the language barrier when you're in the ring with a Japanese opponent? Um, you know what? The, there really wasn't a, a language barrier in the ring because um, a lot of the Japanese wrestlers, especially the ones that Became, became big stars well, you know when, when uh, like the giant baba had a, you know like uh, the funk family basically dory jr and terry and, and and i guess dory senior when he was still alive and i don't know how they developed their relationship with with japan but a lot of the japanese the young japanese wrestlers would come over and, and spend time in the United States and in, 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 in the Amarillo territory. Ah, okay. And, and would start there. And so, um, you know, it was kind of like, 
the basic the basic wrestling language they knew in English, you know. So and it's kind of like you know one tackle, drop down, get it again, you know. Um, which basically, if I had a headlock on a guy and I said one tackle, drop down, get it again. Or if he had the headlock on me, which means he, I'm going to shoot him off. He's going to hit me with a tackle. He's going to hit the ropes again. I'm going to drop down. And then when I stand up and turn around, he's going to grab the headlock again and take me over. One tackle, drop down, get it again. Ah, okay. So, you know, they learned the English uh, language in terms of, you know, calling uh, wrestling moves. So, Well, I'm sure that that makes life a lot easier. However... Yeah. Life over there doesn't seem like it's especially easy because you guys are traveling all over the place. You're there for about a month. You have very few days off. I was looking at your full schedule while you're over there. Uh, and I want to give a shout out real quick to uh, John Alred. I mentioned him the last time we were talking about this. Um, I want to shout out to him again because he helped me to locate some of this added information, which is really hard to find, especially, you know, from Japan at this time and certainly even from from Georgia at this time. But I wound up seeing. Oh, go ahead. OK, but but. To your point, here's the difference, though, in Japan. All right. Yeah, in the United States, I've got to get myself to all these places. Okay. Ex 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 I, with the exception of like when, uh, you know, when when I when I started going to St. Louis, and St. Louis was it's another old story about the influence of the St. It's kind of like if you went to St. Louis and you got over there in St. Louis. People were going to hear about you all over the country. And that's one of the things that helped me, you know, uh, but Japan, we didn't have to worry about anything, but getting in the ring and having a match because everything else was taken care of. Our hotels were taken care of. Um, all our transportation. I mean, they actually, we, we, we all got on a tour bus, you know, and, uh, and, you know, uh, and maybe two tour buses, one for us and, you know, one for the other, you know, for the Japanese guys. But, uh, and so we never had to worry about, you know, all we had to do every, every day is we would look, look on the board and they would have a time. And when you we read the time that, that mess kind of like as it said, 10 o'clock, that means we're leaving at 10 o'clock on the bus the next day. And so. Okay. Yeah. And they, you know, everything else was taken care of. And the only thing, the only thing that we had to pay for in Japan was our food. So, you know, and, and the other thing I'm seeing in my research, and I'm glad you brought up the bus because, uh, you know, I had, I'd seen some stuff about, you know, the bus and I was like, okay, I wonder what that experience was like as far as getting on a bus with a bunch of, of guys, uh, and, and Japanese guys at that. Like, I wonder if it was fun, but here, what I saw was that during this tour, uh, you're out there with the likes of Hanson and Brody and, uh, and Harley race is going to be part of this tour, uh, at one point as well. So, yeah. I mean, is it, is it kind of a weird question because, you know, you're traveling, it's work, but like, is it fun? Cause it seems like being on, on the bus with a bunch of guys playing cards, <laughs> drinking would actually be like a blast. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and they, and that's one, you know, I didn't, I didn't get into the card game so much, but a lot of them did. I mean, that's how they passed the time, you know, I'd get a book and read or something, but, um, and, you know, and every day was different, um, you know, and um, uh, some of the longer uh, some of the longer trips, instead of, you know, taking the bus, they would take us. We would just get in the bus and go to, to the train station. Now, I'm going to tell you something. You talk about a country that's got I mean, they they they, they have what they call the bullet train. Mm. And this train goes it, it's it goes 100 miles an hour. Uh, or, or, or more, more. And, you know, so, uh, and occasionally, occasionally, like if we went to another, obviously there's, I, uh, Japan is, is several islands, you know, the main Island, you know, and, and then, uh, the, 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 the one up North is called Hokkaido. And then, um, I'm trying to think a couple of the other ones, but, uh, um, yeah. So you would have to travel by boat occasionally then to get out to these other islands? No, we would we would fly. Oh, okay. This is like a little puddle jumper type plane. Well, yeah, where or you know, yeah, no commercial plane, you know, they Really? Yeah. Wow. 
the, man, I mean, they pull out all the stops to make sure that you guys were comfortable and at home there. It sounds like a really kind of a great experience. It was, it really, it really was, you know, but you know, you, you know, you work, you know, uh, the wrestling was, you know, kind of some of the guys call it kind of like a, it, it, it was like a, a it, it was stiffer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it's like you know if you chopped a guy man you chopped him yeah uh so it was it was snug you know it was i guess you know but i mean it wasn't it wasn't you know it was like there was never anybody that i wrestled with like i and went oh gosh i don't want to work with this guy he's terrible they were all good you know I've heard you talk about uh, Jumbo a little bit before, and certainly we've talked about Baba and, and how, how well he treated you, especially as your career was winding down and coming to an end. Um, did you ever become buddies with any of the other guys, like Tenru, Sato, yeah. or Kabuki? I mean, um, I, I, know, I, I knew all those guys. I mean, um, and, you know, we, we were all, you know, there, there was nobody I didn't, you know, like, nobody had, like that I didn't like, uh, and I seem like seemingly got along with everybody. And so did, you know, most, most of the guys over there. Another big, big happening during this tour of Japan is that you're set to work with Jerry Lawler while you're there on 10, 14 with the vacant NWA United national title on the line. Lawler would forfeit the match and you'd be named the champion. Any memory of why Lawler would forfeit that match? Uh, <laughs> no, um, you know, the only, the only reason I, I, you know, could think of is that he didn't want to put me over, I, which I don't know, you know, maybe I wasn't like a, a, a big enough star at the time for him to do a job for. So, is but I'm exactly close to Memphis at this time. Why is he worried about putting somebody? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, I guess because maybe news from Japan would travel. I don't know. Yeah, well, it's it's interesting. And I mean, here you are, you're, you know, you work for the NWA, but you're in Japan and you're becoming an NWA United National title, which I believe is a title that was exclusive to Japan. Yeah. Um. So it's 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 interesting that this is happening. Even more interesting that Lawler might not want to put you over. But uh, did you ever get a chance to work with Jerry over the course of your career? You know, I never did work, and I, I never worked with Lawler. I never did, and wow. uh, you know, and and late and later, I, you know, and I we never had a, I never had a discussion with him about that. I mean, I just you know, I just forgot about it. I mean, I don't know, you know, different guys, you know, have different reasons for leaving the, leaving the, the country. I don't know, but I can't. I mean, did he leave, or did he just not? come to japan all i had in the notes was that he forfeited so like in my head that means he's there and he doesn't do the match refuses to do it um however i could be wrong maybe he just didn't make it overseas maybe he didn't want to come over well, i never hit, i never remember him any, even being there okay so, so. May, maybe he never made it who knows yeah um, interesting. You never worked with him though, because you, you guys are two guys kind of running parallel. Uh, he's considered a great worker, certainly in, in his territory and you're, you've been great everywhere you've gone. Uh, so it's, it's fascinating to me that you guys have never see, the, the Jerry, you know, uh, he, he spent most of his time in, in Memphis and you never got a chance there. And I never went there. And that's like, you know, that's funny because it's just 200 miles North of me. You know, it's like, um, um, <laughs> and, uh, I just, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I just kept going back to work for Bill. Uh, so on Halloween night, 1983, which, uh, we're recording this on Halloween. So this is 40 years ago as we're recording this today, you challenge Harley race for his NWA world title and lose while you're over there in Japan. We've talked about your history with Harley on the show a bunch, but never really what your experiences were like working with him in the ring. What was it like to step into the ring with a legendary Harley race? Um, for me, it was awesome. I mean, um, cause you know, the relationship I had with Harley went way back. Harley's a man who tried to save my father's life the night he died. And then <clears throat> I remember when I first started, uh, wrestling and it was, you know, um, it was the summer of 75. Um, 
Well, and but I, I, that's when I was working for Bill Watts. Well, then um, I went I, after a year. I went back to Amarillo, and now I was working the Amarillo territory. And I think this is uh, while Harley was champion. And I remember uh, in a conversation we had, you know, he's and he he just told me he says, "Kid," he says, "You know." Um, uh, he said, if I have anything to do with it one day, this belt to be around your waist. Wow. You know, um, and he had that much confidence in me. I, I wanted to ask you too, Ted, uh, you know, Harley is, he's one of those guys that anytime you ask a wrestler about Harley race, they say like, Oh, I love the guy. One of my favorite wrestlers, kind of like the ultimate pro wrestler. Yeah. Um, they don't really talk about his ring skills though. They, they use words like believable and tough and stuff like that when it came to harley's ring skills what what would you what did you think about that oh gosh i mean yeah i mean he could do it and uh, the thing is it's it's everybody's got their own style and it was uh i wrestled harley more than once um as when he was champion and uh one of the places that i wrestled him like i said and and wrestled to, wrestled him to a one hour draw, mm. and you know, an hour wrestling match. I mean, you you know, you got to time everything. And uh, so anyway, he he was the boss. I just I got in there and listened to everything he said. But but that was uh, that was like putting me over. I mean, I, I was making a name for myself. But for a young guy like me to be given uh, an opportunity, and I think it, uh, uh, the, the, oh, I know what it was. Um, we had a match, we had a tag team match. It was me and uh, I can't remember who my partner was now. I think it was a guy named Bulldog Bob Brown. Okay. Might have been. But anyway, I, we had a tag team match against Harley and somebody else. Anyway. And so in the tag team match, I pin Harley. Wow. I get a three count on Harley on television in this tag team match. That's a big and, deal. And, uh, and the announcer even got all excited and said, ladies and gentlemen, we have a new world champion. And then, then, and then, and then had to correct himself. He said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but you know, uh, uh, you know, he, we don't have a new, new world champion because this is a tag team match. But Harley Race, is, you know, who is a world champion, has been pinned by Ted DiBiase. Well, that was a setup for us to wrestle in St. Louis at the Keel Auditorium, which is the big auditorium there. And um, wrestling, uh, St. Louis is just one of those hubs. It was one of those places where the wrestlers that came there, they came from all over the territories. I mean, there'd be, there'd be a couple guys. I mean, I remember, uh, uh, I don't know, a uh, couple guys that were wrestling for Vern Gagne. I can't remember right now who it was, but they would come down and uh, it just, it was like a, a melting pot, but it was, it's hard to describe St. Louis wrestling, but it's anyway. Man, historic and historic yeah. for you know, you know, you a young guy to you know have a guy like Harley Race putting you over. Like, man, it's. Uh, yeah. I hope our audience understands what a big deal that is. Yeah. Uh, let's get back to the states and Georgia Championship wrestling. After leaving Japan as the NWA United National Champ, you'd return and immediately target Tommy Rich, uh, and actually you'd be replacing Harley Race to face Rich in the Omni on November sixth where you would be disqualified in the match. That match, as far as I could tell, would not be mentioned on TV, however. Um, so instead, your TV return would happen under more unique circumstances on November 11th in Macon. Let's have a look at that. I want to mention here right now that we also have a very piece of film that was taken by somebody and sent to us here in a situation that just happened concerning Tommy Rich. Somebody is after Tommy Rich. Uh, We've got the clip that was sent to us, and we thought this would be the time to show it and just let the people see right away. We don't know who, but I think the, f the film clip is uh, self-explanatory. I think it is indeed. Let's go to that right now. Mm -hmm. 
mask and uh, Tommy Rich caught totally unawares in a full power slam. It's difficult to determine because the person is wearing street clothes, and uh, but it's not difficult to figure out that he's an extremely powerful individual. Well, as you know, Tommy has been going after the world's title. Tommy has been going with a partner after the tag team titles held by the uh, Road Warriors. And uh, Tommy is certainly to be considered and reckoned with. Here we have a man that comes into the ring at a match, not scheduled, don't know who he is, with a mask. And Tommy, at this point, as we can see, is trying to take that mask off. But the film will stop here in just a moment, and we still won't know who he is. Uh, the interesting thing, too, and may I just suggest this to all of you who may be watching, don't ever jump into a ring, because, my friend, uh, you're putting yourself in great jeopardy, as this man, whoever he was, has put himself into it. I have a hunch, however, that he is a professional uh, competitor. I'm sure of it, but the thing is, and the important point is, as Tommy said, he was unsuccessful in his attempt to hurt Tommy, because if you take a look right now, you'll see who's in that ring. All right. Uh, that mask man looked pretty familiar, doing some familiar things in there uh, with the power slam and the, the fist drop. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, as we would know, uh, you know, your your uh, feud with Tommy Rich would kind of culminate when Rich would actually, I believe, be uh, he would be suspended by the uh, by Georgia and he would come back as the masked Mr. R. So yeah. uh, <laughs> so this is kind of like a fun. Oh, yeah. What was what, what was great about that is, you know, we do the thing with me having the mask on and who is it? Who is it? And finally, everybody fit, finds out. Mm -hmm. and, and so then, you know, when when. When, uh, you know, we, we have this match and lo the losers leaves town or something and everybody obviously is expecting Tommy to win and he doesn't, mm -hmm. I win. And, and, uh, and, and then this Mr. R shows up and everybody just goes wild because everybody knows that it's Tommy Rich. I mean, he's got a mask on, but his <laughs> blonde hair is hanging out <laughs> Underneath the underneath the mask, and you know, I, 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 we had fun with that because I'm screaming and complaining. I said, "It's Tommy Rich! It's Tommy Rich!" <laughs> <laughs> Some turnabout is fair play, and man, just such fun stuff. And yeah, I believe it was a loser leaves town. It wasn't a suspension for Tommy Rich, uh, but man, just such a cool angle. And yeah, uh, just a, a really fun way to kind of bring you back after you, uh, you know, your tour of Japan there. Uh, do, do you have yeah, any and, and it was a pleasure working with Tommy because he was so easy. I mean, yeah. you know, he, you know, he was one of those guys. He was just a natural. And my gosh, you know, I mean, uh, he was so over in Georgia. Oh my gosh, you know, he, you know, everybody loved every lover, everybody loved Tommy. Man, uh, to say that he became a top guy in that in that region is an understatement. He was super, super over at this time, uh, and you can see it on the TV. So I mean, you know, they need to put him with a with a strong heel. And brother, it was you. We saw it in that promo earlier. We're gonna see another one before this thing is over. And yeah, it's uh, you were you were bringing the heat. Uh, and, <laughs> <laughs> well, look, another another crew of guys that's bringing the heat is Paul Ellering, Jake Roberts, and the Road Warriors, who will form the original Legion of Doom in Georgia at this time. Um, uh, Ted, Paul Ellering, not a guy that's likely to come up often on our show here. Did you have much experience with him, and what did you think of his work? Uh, man, I, I liked Paul. I mean, um, I mean, you know, he was um, in the manager role. He was great. And he was managing, correct? Yes. So I think that he would still be active at times in the ring during this era. But I think for the most part, his uh, his active ring time was over. He was just and, I, and, and for whatever reason, I rem I, yeah, I know he had wrestled, but I, I and I, I think I, you know, I don't think that I, I don't, I can't, I can't, I can't personally remember having a match with Paul, but I know I, I know I dealt with him when he was in the manager role so and he was in phenomenal shape himself if you look at a picture of a young oh, Paul Ellering, just yeah. absolutely jacked uh yeah. so yeah. i want to say that he had suffered some kind of an injury and he was now kind of uh, pretty much a full-time manager yeah um so it's it's interesting to see guys like jake and the road warriors and i know that nikita koloff was living with those guys it was like this house of just these crazy guys the road warriors and jake and, and nikita all living together uh while they're there in georgia i know that at the time ted you're a married man however it's like you're still a young man 
And these guys are out, you know, partying and having a hell of a time as a bunch of young single guys. I mean, during this time, is it like you're going to work and just going home? Or are you like hanging out with the guys coming over to the house, traveling with them? Um, no, I was I was married guy. I was I went home. And that's the other thing about Georgia is um, the thing I loved about Georgia was there were a few exceptions, but basically I went home every night. And like when I was working in mid South, you know, that wasn't the case, you know, there was, you know, and, and or Amarillo, you know, you know, name a territory. There's a lot of times when, you know, you're, you're spending two or three days on the road, you know, uh, or staying over somewhere. But Georgia is one of those places where, I mean, you know, all, all the shots were relatively short and you could, you know, like Columbus, Georgia, you know, that was a regular show and it was like a hundred miles away. Mm. Macon, Georgia, it was like 50 miles south of Atlanta. Yeah. I mean, that was one of those places where I could, I could go home every night. So yeah, I didn't do a lot of partying there. I can see where, you know, that that would be great for you and your mental state, but also great for your relationship. If you're home every night or almost every night, like, man, that's, that's a good yeah. thing. I know my wife would be. Yeah. Nice. And there, there were, uh, um, I know that they, they started, we started going, um, like we would fly, we would fly from, we would do the TV in Atlanta on Saturday morning and then go to the airport and fly to Columbus, Ohio. And we worked, uh, Columbus and eventually, uh, I mean, we'd work Columbus and maybe one other place, you know, and then, and, and right back to Atlanta. <laughs> I was crazy, but then they, they tried that. Then we would do it. I remember we eventually evolved into going into Columbus after TV working Columbus. And then we would do a tour up in that area about oh, Columbus, Ohio and da, 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 whatever, 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 whatever. And then like on Friday night, uh, or, or crazy, everybody would go back to Columbus and we would get on the earliest flight out of Columbus on Saturday morning. And we would fly back into the Atlanta airport and get in our cars and go straight to the TV station. You know, Crazy. funny that you should bring up Columbus and making the tour of Cleveland because that's at, or of Ohio, because that's what we've got to talk about next. On November 18th, you'd have a really, really busy night in Cleveland, Ohio. First, you'd take on and defeat Ronnie Garvin. Ronnie was in an absolutely unforgettable feud with Jake Roberts at this time. And Ronnie is going to be a special guest on my other podcast, The Snake Pit, with Jake Roberts, so that the two of them can discuss their rivalry 40 years ago. I'm actually talking to him here in uh, like seven days. Uh, so, Ted, what can you tell us about working with Ronnie Garvin? Oh, it, it was it was so easy. Ronnie was great. He really was. And... Uh, and, and just a real good guy too. Um, you know, I, you know, no complaints. It's kind of like, it was like working with Ronnie was like, almost like having a night off. Really? I mean, when, and working with Jake, you know, uh, again, because I believe all of us came from the same, um, we looked at wrestling the same way. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the, you know, you know, like, what the business is about, you know, how, you know, everything. Um, yeah, he was, you know, easy, 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 easy. Man, and the guy was in phenomenal condition. It's funny talking to Jake about Ronnie. And actually, uh, whenever I spoke to Ronnie on the phone to, to get set up with him to, to come on my podcast with Jake, uh, one of the first things he said was like, man, Jake and I had some very, very physical battles. And even and Jake would say like, man, getting in the ring with Ronnie was like half a shoot. He was like, I loved working with him, but like we would we would beat the shit out of each other. And Ronnie oh, confirmed oh, that. Yeah. was oh, he yeah. pretty rough with you in there too. Oh, I mean, no, I mean that was just it was we we accepted that fact. Yeah, always snug. If you know, if you're gonna get you're gonna get a chap, you know, everybody in the building's gonna hear it. Like, wow. <laughs> Well, Ronnie would go on to become the NWA world champion in 1987. At the time, did you see that kind of potential in him? Um, you know, yeah, I did. Just I his, sure. his ring work, his look, all of it. The oh, full oh, yeah. yeah. 
the same night that you defeated Ronnie Garvin in Cleveland, you go on to win another match, and this time it's against Brett Sawyer for his NWA National Heavyweight title. Uh, it's a big win here, Ted, and a prestigious belt, a belt that's actually still in use today with uh, Billy Corgan's NWA. Do you have any uh, memory of working with Brett Sawyer? Uh, you know, I, not a lot. I mean, I, I, he was a good worker. I remember that he was good. It wasn't like, you know, uh, it wasn't like, you know, pulling hairs with somebody or, or, you know, uh, uh, having to, um, tell somebody what to do step by step by step by step. You know, we just, we went in and did it. And then he was, yeah, you know, he was a great worker. Now, uh, his brother, of course, is Buzz Sawyer, and uh, and Buzz would probably go on to be the bigger name of the two. Who? How would you compare their ring work? Did you like working more with Buzz or with Brett? Uh, gosh, I'll be honest with you, I, I can't remember. Ah, okay. I mean, I didn't, I didn't work with those guys that much. Okay, so. I know that uh, we'll be talking about it next time we cover Georgia. Uh, coming up soon, you're going to be defending that national heavyweight championship against Buzz Sawyer. So, mm-hmm. uh, so we'll, we'll we'll watch back the match and and talk about it. But I don't know. You know, I know that Buzz gets a lot of flack for the kind of man he was outside the ring. But from mm-hmm. what I've seen, at any time I see any of his work, I'm like, yeah, dude, he's pretty good. Oh yeah, yeah, and you know, I would probably agree about with with him getting a lot of flack about how he was out of the ring. You know, but uh, but in the ring, he was, you know, uh, it was all business. Um, I'm asking you to reach back 40 years, but on a night like this where you'd work twice, is it safe to assume that they'd have to cut you a larger check because you're out there busting your butt in two matches? <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's laughable. <laughs> really? Yeah. I mean, um, I, yeah, it, it might be like it might show up on your check like, you got this much for this town and then you got this much for this town. And I don't know, but I mean, um, <laughs> um, promoters, they, you know, it, it's, 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 it's more like, what, what did you make weekly? And it wasn't like, it was almost, um, they were, they were different every week, but you know, not, not, not a lot of difference. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You could average them out and go, basically, I'm making this much a week. I got gotcha. you. I yeah. see. So, so you would just get, it's not like at the end of the night, they're writing you a check. It would be like a week or two, a couple weeks later, uh, you get a, a Cleveland check and it would say like, here's what you made in Cleveland. And it's, they're not. Well, you know, you get a yet. check, you know, you, you get a check. I don't know, but I can't remember how they pay this in, in uh, Georgia. If we, if we got paid weekly or, or, or bi-weekly, but, but it would be, um, You'd have the towns listed there and how much you made in each one. I got you. All right. Well, on on paper, you should have made more. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Following your victory, you'd have some things to say on TV to Gordon Soley. And uh, let's drop in on that and have a look at the new national heavyweight champion. Right, Gordon Soley. As everyone knows in the game of professional wrestling, it's getting to the top. And at the very top, the pedestal of professional wrestling is the world heavyweight title. But along the way, Gordon Soley, you have to acquire, you have to win titles along the way to attain and get the shot at that top one. It's the only one, I might add you, that has evaded Ted DiBiase. I have been the North American champion four times. I am the national heavyweight champion now. I beat the present world heavyweight champion, Ric Flair, for the Missouri title before he ever had dreamed of becoming the world champion. I hold that victory over him. Ric Flair, start looking over your shoulder. I told you, Gordon Soley, and I told all you people when I came back to world champion wrestling why I was back. And I attained the first goal. I'm a doer, not just a talker. I hear all these people talking about what they're going to do to who. I'm a doer. And I've gone out and I've done it. Ric Flair, get ready. All right. So you just won this national heavyweight championship, but you're kind of positioning it like, yep, I've got this, but it's really more of a stepping stone. I'm trying to get to Ric Flair and that 10 pounds of gold. Um, You've said before that you didn't win the NWA world's title because, you know, as you mentioned, you're kind of back and forth with Watts. Do you believe, though, that if you hadn't left here, 
that you would have inevitably been the NWA World Heavyweight Champion? Um, it's hard to say. Um, um, I mean, I know it's kind of like, um, you know, that's a bit of a political thing, too. I know that uh, the Funks, you know, were, uh, you know, as promoters, I mean, I, you know, I guess there's a, a gathering of all those promoters at some point and, 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 and a vote, I guess. And it's kind of like, and what's funny, it's like, well, I remember when Terry said, told me, he said, you know, uh, you know, and, and again, back to Harley, you know, he, says, I have, if he told me, he says, if I have anything to do with it, you know, eventually one day this will be around your waist. And, you know, Harley was a partner with uh, Bob Geigel. And uh, I can't remember the other guy, but in Kansas City, Pat O'Connor, uh, they were partners. They, they, the, the Kansas City territory was was those guys. They had a vote. Uh, the Funks had a vote. Um, you know, Eddie Graham down in Florida had a vote. You know, who, whoever was a promoter, the promoters all got together. And, you know, based on their vote, you know, somebody's, you know, so I, if I had stayed, I guess, you know, in the NWA, you know, territories, and I just, I didn't, I kept going back to Bill Watts because it was good, because it was good, good money. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it's kind of, you know, like you, uh, you get word about some territories and some of the NWA territories, you know, and if you're the world champion, you go in there and yeah, you're going to make good money because, you know, anytime the world champ the world champion didn't show up, but maybe a couple times a year. Yeah. You know, because he keeps working the circuit. You know, it is all of the NWA territories. That brings up an interesting point, Ted. You know, you had mentioned earlier as we were talking that Georgia was really nice because you got to be home every night. Yeah. Uh, Now, it's kind of a weird question because of the money that's on the line. However, it's like, you know, you've got this kind of a, a, a good position where you get to go and be with your wife every single night. The travel isn't too bad. If you had been named the NWA champion, you would have been traveling all over the United States to all the different territories. I mean, it would, would that have been something that you would have wanted at the time? Well, I mean, it would be worth it in that, in terms of um, stature in the business, Mm-hmm. Uh, then, then you're you're then you're going to become a, a name that's not just uh, somewhat regionally known. But you're going to be known everywhere. Yes. And you would, you know, I think anybody, I mean, with half a brain, would say, "Yeah, that's you got to do it." I mean, if that's your, if that, you know, are you gonna are you gonna turn down? Not to mention the money. Yeah. And the the the, the money the money so oh my gosh you know you're the world champion uh, that money can set you up. You'd have to leave the comfort of home and go take that yeah. that spot yeah. if they offer it to you. Um, yeah. a, a last thing about this title because it's you know it's uh, guys like Hulk Hogan and Jake and all of these guys consider it kind of the title you know even to this day it's like this was the pinnacle of professional wrestling as being the NWA champion. Um, do you consider not being the NWA champion kind of like a blank spot in your career, something like a like a, a regret that you never wound up getting it? Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, like for for all the talk and 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 all that, um, all the encouragement and 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 just uh, you know what what has been written and 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 just what I know. Um, yeah, it's kind of like uh, it's 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 the one I missed. So, and I didn't miss it by much, but you know, you know, if you you know, what's it? Close is only close is only good in horseshoes and hand grenades. <laughs> <laughs> I know I would have liked to have seen you with the belt, and uh, you know, it's just yeah, I think it is one of those kind of what ifs uh, type type scenarios. Uh, we're gonna wrap up the month here. Uh, you are, you're gonna be working with both Johnny Rich and Tommy Rich, who we're gonna be talking about more down the road on Thanksgiving. You're gonna be back in the Omni and uh, back in the ring with with Brett Sawyer. Arn has talked often on his podcast about the importance of these holiday shows. How significant were Thanksgiving Day shows in a territory like Georgia? Oh gosh, yeah. I mean, um, 
yeah, I mean, the holiday shows were always, I mean, uh, they were always, I don't care where you were, well, you know, what territory you were in. I mean, um, uh, you know, Thanksgiving, Christmas, uh, New Year's Eve, all of those were big nights. And, you you know, th- 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 they're ones that you would think wouldn't be because, well, families are at home. They want to be, the, you know, they, they want to be together as a family. Da, 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 da. Well, the truth is, you know, everybody wants to gather. And usually on Thanksgiving, you, you usually eat about 12 o'clock or one o'clock, you know, not six o'clock at night. Mm-hmm. And the same with Christmas and what have you. And it's kind of like all these people who are off on these days after they eat and unwrap the presents, they want to go do something. <laughs> <laughs> and so, cause it used to be, used to be, those were the only days we were off. And then when they fi- figured out that everybody wanted to go out and, uh, and do something, and it could be one of your biggest money days. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I have, you know, uh, eaten Thanksgiving turkey and then, you know, jumped in my car and ran to the wherever we were working. <laughs> Christmas too, Christmas Eve. Um, it's tough on the family, but man, it got to be worth it. I have to imagine that the payoffs are better uh, in, for these shows. Probably huge turnouts as well. I mean, you're working yeah. at a building like the Omni, so it's. It, I'm sure you guys yeah. are jam packing the place. Um, speaking of the Omni, it's often referred to as the Madison Square Garden of the South. Did you view it in that light? Uh, I don't know. I mean, yeah. I never, not personally, but I mean, obviously it's a big venue, but I never called it. You know. I, I, I think you had to have grown up in that region to kind of view it like that, because I know yeah. that it's, it's mostly guys who grew up around there that are like, oh, yeah, the Omni was where it was at. Um, I mean, you've worked in both venues, MSG and the Omni. How would you say uh, the crowds react? Is it better in MSG or better down south with those passions? Well, better in the, the in, you know in New York. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's uh, yeah. But from somebody who experienced both firsthand, I'll I'll take your word on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Ted, that's gonna do it for this week, man. Uh, this was a blast, and uh, you know, again, we were talking here about 1983, but next week we're jumping ahead five years to 1988 and the Survivor Series as you're gonna team up with the Twin Towers, Haku, and the Red Rooster to take on the Mega Powers, Hercules, Coco Beware, <laughs> and Billy Jim. So, uh, man, those are that, those are, that's quite a crew of guys, isn't it? That's a, that's quite a crew and the red rooster. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Poor Terry Taylor. Oh yeah. And you know what? Terry's a good friend of mine, a very good friend of mine. And Terry Taylor was one hell of a worker. Mm-hmm. He was really good. Well, look, before we go, I just a reminder, you've got to get over to PremierStreamingNetwork.com and sign up for Premier Plus, sports, entertainment, and other shows. You guys are going to love it if you're a wrestling fan or just a fan of sports in general. I mean, some great entertainment over there. I can pretty much guarantee you're going to dig it. Again, it's PremierStreamingNetwork.com. Sign up for Premier Plus. If you're enjoying our show and you're listening on your podcast app, just do us a quick favor. It only takes you a second. Like, subscribe, and leave us a five-star review because that is going to help Ted and I out a bunch. Also, we would love to interact with you on social. Follow Ted at MDM Ted DiBiase on all of his social media. Follow me at Marcus P. D'Angelo on X. Follow the podcast at Ted DiBiase Pod on every social media platform. And follow Premier Streaming Network at Watch on Premier on X and at Premier Streaming Network on Instagram and Facebook. Ted, this was a really fun episode. I love looking yeah. back to 1983. It's such a unique time in your career. Yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> oh god <laughs> well we'll continue looking at it here down the road and uh we'll have another episode next week right ted all right sounds good and again as i go always remember everybody's got a price for the million dollar man <laughs> <laughs> we'll catch you guys next time right here on everybody's got a pod <laughs>